Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to Rise25 Media or email us at support at rise25media.com. Glenn Cebulski is an award-winning executive chef with over 25 years of restaurant experience. He's opened 24 of his own restaurants. He's consulted for Papa Murphy's Take and Bake Pizza and developed a dough recipe that they purchased from him for $80,000. He's also consulted for Pyology Restaurants. They have over 150 locations. He's a writer for Pizza Today magazine, a speaker at multiple expos, including the International Artisan Expo, the... International Pizza Expo and Northeast Pizza and Pasta Expo. He's written for Outside Magazine, Franchise Times, and appeared on Food Network and multiple other television outlets. He's also the founder of Tossed, Sauced, and Baked, which features award-winning sauces infused with cannabis. Wow, Glenn, thanks so much for joining me. How are you? I'm tired now that I've heard everything that I've done. Um, It sounds like a lot, but uh, it's been fun, and, and I'm fine, Chad. It's really nice to be here. You have a uh, you have a very distinguished history. You, you know, I would think that after you were an award winning chef who developed a crust for Papa Murphy's, I might have just called it quits. But you moved on, and now you've developed your own thing. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, bef- before we get into kind of your specifics in terms of um, owning restaurants and pizza and things like that, what in your life journey led you to become a chef? Where did you decide, like, oh yeah, this is what I'm going to do? Um, realistically, I I hate to sound a little bit cliche, but, uh, food, um, and especially the way my father used to cook, uh, dad cooked for everybody. So anytime he made something, he made a big pot of soup or he made a big, uh, you know, plate of pasta, whatever he did, um, he made sure that there was plenty so that our friends and other people can come over and eat as well. So, you know, for me, Food uh, evokes a lot of memories that are very, very, very treasured to me, um, and and that's really where the passion came from. And then you, I, I'm sure you know you you enjoyed your father's food, but at what point did you decide this is what I'm good at? Oh boy, I, I guess um, uh, you know without any specific uh, one um, uh, example I can give you, uh, I'm good at. It. Um, you know, I think any chef that that um, that that starts, you know, that is a chef now and just starts cooking, they'll talk a lot about when they were in the kitchen with their parents or their grandma or grandpa or something like that. Um, it's the same thing. You know, when you start cooking um, and you start making things that taste different, that you haven't tasted anymore, but you love it because it lays well on your palate. And putting those, you know, ABCs, one, two, threes together on when you're ideating and creating uh, recipes. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of times where I put a spoon in my mouth and, and went, oh, my God, that's horrible. After, of course, ideating it in my mind and saying, wow, these combination of ingredients should go great together. But I've always been very adventurous. I've always used a lot of spices from different countries. Um, and applied them in different ways on my plate, layered the flavor combinations, and I'm good at it. So I think that's where really it starts. Was there ever a time when you were growing up? I, I mean, I, I know you've had you know extensive training and you've certainly built up your skills professionally, but when, when you were growing up where you, you talked your dad into letting you prepare the meal and everybody was like, whoa, <laughs> you need to become a chef. Yeah, I don't know that there was a specific time. I think, you know, um, my dad and, and both my mom were very open to uh, the kids in the kitchen. 
Um, and again, it, it starts with, dare I say it, macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and things like that. Um, you know, you start doing little things that uh, inspire you or you go, wow, that really tastes good together. Or you combine something. So I think that's really the most um, uh I think that the thing that I can think most about is is the first time I made um, a, a spaghetti or a lasagna, and and my father was with very few compliments. Um, although uh, you know he was a tough he was a tough dude, but uh, it was I, I do remember one time where he said, "Wow, Butch, uh, that this is really good." So I don't know how much more that inspired me. I've always loved to cook, and it just seems that people come together. Listen. People come together on food with every single thing that happens in our lives. The great times, the really bad times, food is there. It's a comforting agent for, for our, our, our times when we're sad and, and, and stressed. It, it's also a very happy occasion when you have all your family together and, and it's a celebration. So food's always there and it's very, very important emotionally and, and obviously nutritionally for us. So I think that's the draw for me. It's it really builds my passion. We talked about. I mentioned in in your introduction that you um, you developed a dough for Papa Murphy's. You have an extensive background in pizza. You're an award winning yeah. pizzaiolo. Is that the right way to say it? That's correct. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your journey into pizza and w what um, drew you to that specifically. Well. Again, I think it goes back to really remembering um, every Saturday night when my dad would go down and get Shakey's Pizza because that was our special night. And um, I hate to date myself, but I'm not as young as I used to be. Uh, and we watched Creature Features on Channel 2 um, way back when. And we'd have uh, Shakey's Pizza and, um, uh, you know, we get soda. So that was a really fun time. I, I think that's um, one of the big things. There's not too many people that don't like pizza. Um, in fact, I've never, ever really heard anybody go, oh, I hate pizza. I never eat it. So um, uh, that's one of um, the, the main, I think, things that drew me to pizza. And then, of course, the first time I traveled to Italy, uh, pizza was all around me. And um, uh, I think the challenges of really the intricacies of making dough sauce and cheese and toppings come together um, as a dish, a culinary dish that actually uh, pleases people in pizza. Pizza's just not a pizza anymore, Chad. I loved uh, Shakey's when I was a kid. The texture of the crust as well as the kind of sweetness yet tanginess of the sauce was just spectacular. Uh, so how did you get started as a pizza chef? Tell me a little bit about your training and then how you ventured into it. You know, um, gosh, that goes back to uh, the first trip I ever took to Italy. Uh, my cousin and I met some some guys. We were surfing in Hawaii, met some Italian guys. They invited us over. Long story short, one of them had a restaurant uh, in a small town called Frigene, right outside of Rome on the coast, uh, the Sogno del Mare. And uh, we hung out there and, and they had a wood-fired oven. Everybody in Italy has a wood-fired oven in their homes, basically. And that's, I think, where the, the true um, passion for wanting to know how dough, sauce, cheese, basil, and a little bit of olive oil can taste so magnificent. That's probably where I really started to uh, gain my, my love for baking and pizza. And that was probably around 1988, 1989. Uh, and then ever since, I've just been, uh, you know, chasing that that perfect pizza which there never is going to be one which is why i keep chasing how did you how and where did you start your professional career well you know i worked in a lot of restaurants uh from the dish pits at zimmerman's and in corda madera here in marine county when i was still in high school earning money uh to delis uh like perry's deli and and you know just different restaurants like that because i didn't know what else to do and then when I came home from Italy, um, I decided uh, I had a food company, a prepared foods company called Sonoma Naturals that I had started, and it was very successful. Um, that company was then sold, and I started a uh, pizzeria, and I named my first pizzeria Frigenes after the town uh, in Italy where our friends live. 
And, uh, you know, the rest is history from there. I believe that was in 2001-ish, my first restaurants. What? What kind of uh, were you? Was it? Did it just feel like it came natural to you? Were you nervous when you decided, like, I'm no longer an employee, I'm the boss, yet I still work at the restaurant? Uh, it, I wasn't nervous about it at all. Um, never really have been nervous about you know the the entrepreneurial ship. Um, uh, you know, my risk taking abilities are a lot less now than they were when I was you know 25, 30. But um, the thin crust uh, Rome style pizza that I ate when I was in Italy really was different than anything else here. And um, are you still able to hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. I just lost my Bluetooth, so sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Um, so basically, the thin crust that uh, I, I loved and, and tasted in Italy. I brought to Frigenes in my small town in Petaluma because really nobody had anything like that. So uh, that also was one of the segues to lead into the Papa Murphy story. And, um, and once I started cooking that, people were just amazed. I used a different kind of sauce. The pizza sauce was uh, um, a big plus. I always use the best California whole milk mozzarella um, cheese because, um, you know, the butterfat content is where all the flavor is. It was very simple from there to go on and start layering um, different, uh, um, you know, toppings. And the reality is I opened my first restaurant with about $700. So, okay, $700. So I'm sure given your... uh Given the resource, the financial resources that you had to work with, and just any new restaurant that nobody knows about, what were the early days like, and how did you uh, overcome some of those obstacles? Really tough. I mean, the, the early days were really tough. I had a really good. Um, I had a really good friend, uh, Jeff Howard, and um, Jeff helped me raise some money uh, to to really start expanding the brand. He was integral in in the in the launch of of the first restaurant uh, chain. And so that helped. What also helped was we were able to get a little tiny space down in downtown Petaluma. So all the, the people with businesses came in to get a slice right away. And the word of mouth spread like wildfire. And it was, it was really fun. Now, I opened, I did dishes, I bust tables. Um, I did everything that I needed to do. To make it happen before I could start um, hiring employees, and and uh, that's that's basically how it launched. How many hours a day would you say it took for the first, you know, the first several, maybe a year? Oh goodness, um, minimum 12, 14 hours a day, minimum seven days a week. Oh yeah, absolutely. And at that point in time, I was a, a single father, so um, it wasn't that easy to do, but. Uh, you know, whether, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, I never, I never say no. I, I just, you know, no matter, and everybody gets, you know, don't get me wrong. There were some really, really tough times. Um, the restaurant business is not easy. And every single restaurant owner I know has, has closed stores as I have. Um, extremely difficult lessons to learn, costly, yet they're, stamped into your memory as to tell you, listen, it's not all about great food. You really have to know everything about the restaurant business to be successful. And that's what's led me to, you know, my success at this point. Yeah, you talked about um, you know, you you've you've run um 24, you've opened 24 restaurants. At what point, you know, after you put in the 12 to 14 hour day, seven days a week, did you decide I'm ready for more restaurants? And why did you get to that? How did you get to that point? It was, an, it was a natural progression. It was just a thought process. Um, very early on, I met, uh, I went to a pizza uh, expo. And again, Jeff Howard and I, uh, Jeff goes, we got to go to this. It's in Las Vegas. Let's go and have some fun. So we did. Um, fortunately, we actually won, uh, entered a contest and won a point of sale system, which we didn't have. We only had a cash register. So that kind of changes the uh, trajectory of, of the way you're thinking. Uh, Pizza Expo has been an extremely large part of my success. Um, and it's because I embraced the, the um, education uh, that they give, um, the camaraderie in the industry, and 
Uh, specifically, one guy uh, named Tony Gemignani. I'm sure we'll talk about him a little bit later. But Tony Gemignani, uh, um, you know, he he opened the door to an opportunity, and I pulled the door right off the hinges, and I went deep. So, um, you know, th- this is a this is an industry too where you build lifelong friendships with people, and even if you don't see them for a whole year or so, uh, maybe only at Expo, things like that. If they called you and they needed help and you could help, you help. So you have, uh, you've opened 24 restaurants. Uh, how many specific brands have there been? Um, there have been two brands. Well, actually four different restaurant names. Um, so two brands that were, that were expanded upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I've opened a lot more restaurants for other clients as well. So 24 of my own. There's a total of almost 100 restaurants I've actually opened. So, um, But very important later on in my career, when I could embrace the entire model of opening restaurants. Um, and and that's, been, that's been key to the success is really understanding what your mistakes are. Um, being able to survive a mistake financially and take continue to take that risk, that's also been a big part of, of the success over the years. What's a moment that you look back on that you are particularly proud of in terms of that? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I guess probably the uh, there was a moment um, where I won my first contest and and really realized how important um, recognition is in the industry. Um, And that was, uh, that was at pizza expo. And that was the first time I went, I came in second with my chicken chipotle pizza. And I had one gentleman who's also been very, you know, listen, there's a lot of people that have played a huge part and are still very good friends. Sean browser uh, came up to me and he goes, how, how did you think about this? How how did this come about? Um, because the flavor profile really layered on your your mouth and, and on your palate, and it didn't. You know, there was nothing else like that out there at this at, at that time. What's the biggest? You, you talked about how you, you've opened restaurants, you've had to close restaurants. Is there a biggest pitfall or mistake that you've learned from? Yeah, the biggest pitfall and mistake that I've learned from really is not understanding um, uh, how important demographics and marketing are to the success of a restaurant. Again, uh, there's not one, I I cannot think of one uh, TV um, chef that is out there that has not closed a restaurant. Uh, It is really part of, uh, part and parcel to success. Are you going to be able to get back up and do it again? Um, so I would say that my biggest lesson was really understanding demographics and understanding the, um, uh, the marketing side. You can have the best product in the world. And I always give this one experience in a lot of my seminars is, you know, out in Sebastopol, a little town north of me in Northern California, you know, I, I wanted to have a location out there. And there's a realtor that said, Glenn, I got a great location. It's anchored by this and it's fantastic. 100,000 cars go right past it every single day. And, and that's exactly what they did. They went right past it every single day because really nobody knew I was in there. And I had great food and at that time was winning awards, but nobody knew. So that's a very important part. Demographics, marketing, setting yourself up for success. That was a tough lesson. That was about a $200,000 lesson for me. Is that something that you specifically are able to do now? Do you hire people to do that for you? Or did you kind of transition from doing it to hiring or do you just do it? No, um, I just do it. Uh, you know, there, there are, you know, in the new company, which I know we're going to talk about, um, I have uh, a great friend, um, Harry Miller, who owns uh, uh, Franchise Science. And, and Harry actually took our, our persona um, uh, project to franchise for us. He's, he's brilliant. And, you know, Harry really reconfirmed with me um, and he's involved in the new business as well. Harry really uh, confirmed to me how, how important marketing was and how important demographics were uh, to be able to continue to you know build restaurants and, and make them successful. So now you are you talked about um, your clients and how you've helped them open hundreds of rest, or you know over a hundred restaurants. Uh, I'm sure most people are watching or listening have had Papa Murphy's. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Can you tell me how that came about? Yeah, again, um, I knew uh, Tim uh, Sweeney, uh, a good friend of mine. His uh, mother married uh, Terry Collins. Terry Collins was a uh, exec with, I believe, PepsiCo at the time. And he found two brands, Papa Aldo's and Murphy's Pizza, and combined them to make a take and bake, which really isn't that popular um, east of the Mississippi, simply because people want their pizzas delivered hot and fresh and things like that. But it was, it's a great concept. Um, I believe it's still number five in, in, in the world for sales. It's huge. They've since sold the brand. Terry Collins, uh, is getting on in age right now. Um, but extremely successful, um, uh, corporate food, uh, guy, professional. And, you know, he tasted my crackers, uh, that I was making in, in Sonoma Naturals and some of my sauces. And I back then was doing um, pizzas out of Sonoma Naturals as well. That's kind of where I first started ideating. And he tasted those and he goes, listen, he goes, I need help. Uh, and for a company like that at that time to come to me, um, listen, luck, timing. Um, I knew him. Uh, he had attended one of my uh, um, golf tournaments that I put on to raise money for the American Heart Association. Uh, and I remember that. You know, when you talk now that I'm I'm going back in my memory, you talk about significant times. I was serving him dinner along with everybody else, and he looked at me and he said, "You should be in the food business." And that didn't resonate with me at that time. But here I am in the food business some um, thirty years later, uh, and Terry Collins had a big, big um, a part to do with that. So he loved the crust. He's basically told me, Glenn, I've got flour mills all over the country and I got people working on this. Um, and he said, some guy from Pengrove gives me exactly what I want. So that's how that went. So now you are consulting uh, for multiple restaurants. What is a, what's something that somebody who decides to open a restaurant and then hire you, what's something that you think that they haven't um, realized before consulting with you? Is there kind of a common thing that people open lo- overlook and then they talk to you and they're like, oh yeah, I need to remember that? There's, there's, there's quite a few things. I, again, I think I have to go right back down to operations. Um, there are people out there that will probably hear this um, podcast that uh, will not know what their prime costs are in their restaurant. And again, um, passion plays a big part. Being able to create Good food plays a good part. One thing I missed early on was the numbers. And those numbers have to deal with demographics. They have to deal with marketing. They have to deal with what your prime costs are in your restaurant. You can literally estimate the success of a restaurant based on where you are, what your demographic is, what you're going to be serving, and making sure that your prime costs, which are your labor and your food costs, are at a certain percentage for success. If it's not there, you're never going to get it. That's all there is to it. Restaurants fail a lot because restaurateurs like myself went into the business because their mother's sister's uncle had a a recipe that everybody loves and, and they know it'll sell everywhere. It's that kind of mentality that we go into with the passion of our hearts and our hard work and we forget about the numbers. The devil's in the details. And if you don't know what your prime costs are, if you don't know what your spoilage is, if you don't know how to cross utilize ingredients to keep your costs low, it's going to be a struggle. So you have people have to face all those obstacles, all those concerns. And then last year we have the pandemic. Has there been a common piece of advice or, you know, a common thread of consultation that you've provided to survive that or even thrive in it? Yeah, the first thing was, man, I'm glad I don't have any restaurants right now, to tell you the truth. Sure. Um, and then if you flip forward, one of the things that, that you know, I've said on a couple different podcasts and, and to a lot of my, my um, clients is, this is the best time to open a restaurant that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And, and the reason is, is because the writing's on the wall as to what we were up against in COVID and still are up against. You know, this is not the last virus that's going to come through. Hopefully it's the last time, you know, America reacts to it the way we did. But even even still, setting your restaurant up now for success is easier since we've seen what happened in the past year and a half. 
And when I say easier, I don't mean easy peasy, like no problem. I mean, we've got data now that proves how important to go is, right? Pickup and delivery is where people sometimes uh, would just not even think about that. Now we have all of that data and it really does help. And I think it's a very good time to open restaurants. Okay. That's, that, that would be maybe counterintuitive to what a lot of people might think. Well, and, and you know, um, that's, not, that, that's, a, that's an absolutely fair comment on your part, simply because there was so much devastation in the industry. And I'm sure there's going to be people that fear this that say, well, yeah, but you weren't in it. Well, I was in it, actually, because um, all of my business went away as well. When you're doing consulting and things like that, nobody's paying anybody to help them with their restaurants. Um, everybody was in survival mode. So it was tough for everybody. I don't want to make light of it at all. There's a lot of my friends who closed a lot of restaurants, but that also goes back to the business side of, of restaurant touring. When you're in the restaurant business, you know, um, you've got two, three, four successful, profitable stores. You're going to want to expand that. So you're either going to get capital in or you're going to expand from profits that you're generating off your other stores. Well, how long do you hold a store that's not making money and feed it the profits from the other store? That's not the way to go. Um, some people have to bootstrap it. I understand that. And I've had to do that. Uh, but the same thing has happened to me. I then took you know, a chance on a location and was feeding that location with profits. And it didn't make sense until I moved it. So there are a lot of variables in this. This is not a business that is very easy at all. But I also don't believe that if you are are following the guidance of, of a great consultant or you know everything that you you should be successful in this business. It doesn't have to be such a high percentage of failures if you are crossing your T's and dotting, dotting your I's and bringing in people that know more than you do about things that are important to the success of the restaurant. So you have your consultancy and then you've also started your a new venture, Tossed, Sauced, and Baked. That's about five years old, I believe. 2016 is when you started it? Yeah, 2016 is when I started it. Um, and I was very quiet about my work with cannabis, uh, simply because of my success in the industry. I didn't want to um, be categorized as a pothead or anything like that. It had nothing to do with that. Um, cannabis is an, uh, an extremely... Um, uh, amazing um, plant, and and the benefits of that plant have been studied and and used for over three thousand years. So um, it was really interesting. I know we'll talk about the the um, uh, the artisan bakery expo that I just spoke at, but um, cannabis is here to stay in food. Uh, cannabis is here to stay. And it's just a matter of time before, um, you know, the United States legalizes it like Canada already has. Um, the FDA is getting ready to approve uh, CBD and food, which is going to be another big uh, um, step forward for our company. Um, and and it's, it's, it's definitely uh, um, part and parcel to who I am. What made you decide to kind of, you know, you've, you've had success creating traditional and untrad or non-traditional pizzas, I'm sure, but not with cannabis. What made you decide to take this next step? It seemed like, you know, again, I'm getting, uh, um, as I get older or more mature, um, my wife would argue that I'm mature, mm -hmm. but uh, I also, you know, I can't do the things I used to do. Um, you know, travel back east every other week for a whole week and work on a concept and things like that. I like to stay home uh, closer to my home base. Um, cannabis is an opportunity that I think if the opportunity is addressed properly is going to be extremely successful. Um, it is still in its infancy as far as the United States is concerned. And again, I'm a firm believer that the plant um, holds keys to health and wellness for us that um, uh, have been proven already through through studies outside of the United States. And now we have a couple of universities that are able to grow cannabis and they're studying it too. It's just a matter of time. Uh, and quite frankly, um, the, the financial benefits are amazing. Uh, Constellation Brands invested $4 billion 
um, into canopy growth. Uh, that was three, four, five years ago. Uh, canopy growth is still not profitable. So when you have large companies like that coming into the industry, then it also confirms that there's money there, there's investment capital there. Um, and if you're in it for the long haul and you want to make products that people are going to be able to use every single day, uh, pantry products, uh, which is what I, I envisioned and it's, it's coming true. So that's kind of fun. You, uh, you have some products. Tell me a little bit about your product specifically. Um, I know one of which is already award winning. So tell me a little bit about those, what you guys offer. So, you know, we've got, I've, I've infused 75 of my award winning products, which means I've won awards on, on these recipes, um, without infusing them with canvas at, uh, different, different competitions nationally and internationally. So I knew from a marketing standpoint that that would help me as a mainstream chef. Um, it would help me market the brand better um, because there's really no mainstream chefs out there that are, are well, there's a lot of chefs cooking with cannabis. But from a mainstream side, um, uh, I don't think there's very many of those. And I happen to, um, I happen to believe that it's going to make a big difference in the way the brand grows. Um, and that's, that's really one of the reasons why I, I chose to, to start now. It's also, listen, it's a manufacturing, um, company. So basically we, we have manufacturers that we give our, our, our recipes to. They make our product for us. Our distrib our distribute, distribution network distributes for us. So it's a great business model that we can grow with it out being, um, too financially uh, um, of a of a burden. In other words, you know, instead in, in instead of investing ten million dollars um, in in a company, I can invest a lot less than that and utilize the the legal uh, manufacturers and distribution networks that are out there and uh, become more of a marketing and sales. And you know, that's what I'm doing right here. <laughs> you have a trophy. One of your products has already received a, a trophy. Can you show it I, to us and tell us about it? I can. And um, really cool. This is from WeedCon, WeedCon Productions. And I know it's probably hard to read, but I'll read it to you. It says 2021 WeedCon Buyer's Cup, first place, best confection, toss sauce baked, cannabis, in cannabis infused caramel sauce. So we started with three sauces and um, it was it was interesting from a marketing perspective. Uh, the business is based on creating pantry products that people can use every day that are infused with THC and CBD or just CBD um, salad dressings, uh, pasta sauce, pizza sauce. I've infused crackers, breads. Um, Fresh pasta. There's just the, the list goes on and on. The reason why I picked sweets first is because the cannabis market is predominantly in edibles are all sweet. It's candy, it's gummies, it's chocolates and things like that. So from a marketing standpoint, um, I first had decided to go with four savories. And I think that would have been a really big mistake. Instead, we went to three saw, um, uh, sweets and one sweet or uh, two sweets and one sweet savory. So we have a, a, a chocolate sauce that is just out of this world. We have, of course, our award winning caramel sauce and we have a sweet and spicy barbecue sauce. And all three of those have sold extremely well uh, in the market so far because people can relate to the sweets. They can relate to instead of having a chocolate bar or a gummy or a piece of caramel, now they can have sauces that they can actually use on ice creams, cookies, in baking. When you're barbecuing, you know, you're finishing your your whatever you're barbecuing with your barbecue sauce. Um, and and it just works. And so again, a little bit of luck. I think a lot of knowledge to be able to switch. And one of the other things that's really important, put your ego aside. It's nice to be able to wear shirts that say award winning and you've done this and done that and everything. But the bottom line for chefs is put your ego aside and do what's right for not only the business, but for your customer base. Um, 
we've seen so, too many egos ruin chefs where they think they're all that and, 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 you know, a bag of chips. The bottom line is if you put us all in a, in a um, restaurant and I've done this with, with what, 13, 14 other chefs in Italy and you put us in a kitchen, there are no egos. Everybody grabs the station and starts making dinner for everybody. And that's where the magic happens. So when, when a customer or, a, you know, somebody trying one of your products tries it, what, what, what will they experience? Obviously, it'll taste good. Is there going, going to be other things that come along with the experience of eating these products? Well, sure, because you've got THC and CBD, so you're going to get somewhat of an entourage effect. Um, purists in the industry will say that's not an entourage effect because you don't have all the terpenes and you don't have all of the cannabinoids in there. But uh, we also have to be realistic. And the majority of the United States has not consumed any cannabis at all. Yet, CBD products are flying off the shelves in stores everywhere. So what, you know, there, there's a couple of different com components. Of course, THC is going to have that psychoactive effect. You're going to get high. You're going to feel good. Um, each bottle comes with um, a, I should have a bottle here, right here to hold up. And I do it's over there. I'll go grab one. But um, each bottle has 100 milligrams of THC and 25 milligrams of CBD. And then our CBD only products have 500 milligrams of CBD. CBD does not have any psychoactive um, aspect to it, uh, but it does have other benefits of, of um, and we, we never make uh, medical claims because we're not uh, doctors and we have not done the research ourselves on any of the claims, but it has been noted that CBD helps people with anxiety to calm down. We know that there are two drugs on the market that have CBD in them for children who, who, um, uh, suffer grand mal seizures, that it radically helps them improve on those seizures. Um, our fighting men and women, uh, God bless all of them, uh, all of our soldiers out there and our veterans have found that CBD helps them with their PTSD, um, where, uh, you know, they used to use uh, pharmaceutical drugs that they only get addicted to. So things like that with, with actually um, cancer, and um, other patients like that, CBD is the cannabinoid that helps inspire your, your, um, uh, your hunger, your appetite. So that's also been very, very beneficial for people. Um, in the past year and a half with COVID, people have been using CBD to relax, de-stress, take that anxiety out of their life instead of drinking two or three or four bottles or glasses of wine a night. So there's a many, many, many benefits, a lot more to come as the research is done in the U.S. and the U.S. opens up to research that Israel, the doctors in Israel have done for the past 40 years. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, CBD and, and cannabis is going to be everywhere. And it I, have, be. I have just a couple more questions for you. Cool. What have been the biggest turning points in kind of the five year, uh, five year plus lifespan for this company? Um. Boy, there's been a quite a few turning points. Uh, one of my first partners, unfortunately, uh, went to bed one night, didn't wake up the next morning. He had a massive heart attack. A vision of health. Uh, Mark Stolfi in Chicago was was integral in, in helping me get uh, the first round of funding done in the company. So, um, you know, I say a quick prayer to Mark uh, all the time. I feel his presence and his spirit. I know he's around. Um, and the, also the people that, that put in the first, um, amounts of seed capital. So that was a big turning point. Um, uh, the galley, um, Annie Holman, um, all the partners that have helped and jumped in and, and, uh, you know, gotten the, helped get the, um, product off the ground. Uh, this is not a one man band at all. Um, nice thing is we just opened up our, our seed round of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, capital raise. So we, we've got a, a capital raise going right now. We've got proof of concept in the market in California, and we're looking to expand nationwide. So um, I certainly did not do all of that myself. There's been a lot of people that have helped, and there's going to be a lot, of, lot more people that help. Final question. We're big fans of gratitude around here, and we like to give people a chance to publicly acknowledge the people who have been influential for them. Who are some of those people for you? You've talked about a few here with us so far, who are some people in the industry that you respect and look to advice for and that you've learned from? 
Yes, and we have like three hours. <laughs> um, okay, well, off the top of my head, really, Pete LaChapelle, um, uh, Pizza Today Magazine, the International Pizza Expo, and the International Artisan Bakery Expo. Um, Pete LaChapelle, and there's way too many people in the organization to name. You all know who you are. You're all great friends, and, and I, I care about you deeply. Um, Emerald Expositions, who now owns uh, Pizza Expo, phenomenal company. I've been very proud to uh, speak for them, write for them for the past 15 plus years. That has been a huge benefit for me in my my culinary uh, um, journey. Tony Gemignani uh, is a good friend who I probably only see once a year and he lives about 30 miles away. We're all so busy. But there's guys like Tony Gemignani, Joe Carlucci, um, uh, Sean Browser, Michael Shepard, Kenny Bryant, um, all the guys on the uh, international uh, um, or world pizza champions team. Um, of course, you know, the the people behind the scenes, uh, Jeff Howard early on, my nephew, Michael Sobolski, was very integral in, in, in teaching me a lot on management in, in Frigenes. So a lot of people, um, there's probably people I've missed here. Uh, Mara Forney Ovens. I can't tell you enough about Mara Forney Ovens, Francisco and Enzo and, and their brothers have, have been integral in, in, in helping me, uh, um, throughout my restaurant career. And, uh, last probably, but not least, California Milk Advisory Board. What a great organization. I'm very pleased to be able to work with them as well on their, uh, pizza contest that they have coming up next month. I, this is the third year in a row and there's just a lot of people. Gratitude is is one thing that we can give freely, um, and and there's a lot of people that I'm extremely I'm I'm I'm, I'm extremely grateful to, to meet you, Chad, and and see where this journey is going to go as well. Um, so I really do appreciate the time uh, that you've taken to do the podcast and invite me on. Grateful for that. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure for me. It's an honor for me to speak with you. So we've been speaking with Glenn Sabolski a distinguished chef, restaurateur, and founder of Toss, Sauced, and Baked. Glenn, where can people find more information about you? You can, um, I've got two websites. First, uh, www.tosssaucedbaked is the cannabis-infused sauce company. And then, of course, www.glensabolski. Um, and that's uh, my culinary uh, site as well. Um, you can go to either one of those sites. You can connect with me uh, via email through those sites. Um, I'm, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to help. When somebody comes to me with a consultation, we don't talk about consultation or prices first. I've got to figure out if I can first help that person. So uh, especially in this time, if you're thinking about the restaurant industry, it's a great time to start. Um, if you're having struggles, call me. Phone calls are free. Let's talk about it first. I'm happy to do that. And my cell phone, I might as well put it out there, 707-774-1668. I'm happy to help if I can. And if I can't help, I probably know somebody that can help me. Okay, Glenn. Thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chad. You too. Bye-bye. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.